Hello and welcome to The Last Andy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. So, today I'm joined uh, Today I'm joined here by Alessio. Hello. Audrey. Hi everyone. And I am your host Alexis. Uh, we'll be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby and today we'll start with seeing how everyone is doing in the Standy Roundup. Other cool, thank you for asking. Uh, last time I checked it was the ketchup. So we are rounding up the ketchup. Okay, I, I like these changes. Fan Reigns of Terror is finished, finally. <laughs> so uh, actually I've been doing a pretty lot of stuff, but I'll just condense it in a few. But I'll just condense it in a few things because it's been a long time. So I got Rift Force Beyond expansion. Of course, there's no way the Capstone Games is uh, releasing stuff uh, in uh, English across the pond. So I got the German edition and across the pond. So I got the German edition and I translated myself and I translated it myself. So <laughs> I have a German expansion. Uh, luckily, the in-game text is very, very, very low. Basically, there's no in-game text. So it was easy and it's a great expansion. I got a couple of good games, but uh, the, the most interesting things thing I have been doing these days uh, was backing on game found the game philosophy, which is a very interesting pitch. It's uh, two friends discussing an argument uh, with, uh, uh, with by placing time. It's uh, very a very fun concept, so I, I backed it. I hope it's a good game. <laughs> So that's uh, basically me. There's probably a lot uh, of other stuff uh, I would probably like to say, but uh, well, the, the most important thing is uh, well, most important thing is uh, well, we need Patreons. <laughs> we uh, we have a Patreon, you know, and uh, we and are we like, like having Patreons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, this is basically a, a, an amateur endeavor, so uh, everything uh, thing, uh, helping with covering expenses uh, is very appreciated. Uh, we don't uh, shamelessly self-advertise, so I'm just shamelessly begging here, but uh, <laughs> the important part is uh, if, if you like the Last and the podcast, uh, and you want to buy us a coffee or our Patreon page, we will recap the, this at, uh, the, at the end of the episode and uh, just help us. That would be very much appreciated. <laughs> we were more likely to forget uh, to mention our Patreon than to uh, plug it. Yeah, that, uh, that's patreon.com forward slash the last patreon.com forward slash the last and D. Anyway. Any, any help to cover mostly the costs of hosting the podcast is always appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you to our uh, Patreon. You uh, brought us here. So thank you, everyone. And uh, so thank you, everyone. And uh, that's everything I had to say. So what have you been up to, Alexis? Uh, myself, not too much recently. Um, I just received yesterday uh, the um, hardback edition of Cyborg, uh, well, the, the inspired by Morgbok cyberpunk uh, game made by uh, John North, the Morgbok creator. It is really cool. Uh, obviously, it's already, yeah, it's, it's already getting mods, so it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mogborg has, has generated a lot of uh, attention. Uh, Mogborg has, has generated a lot of uh, attention over the, um, uh, the RPG community. So a lot of people are making their own modules and stuff, which is great. Uh, and the game itself looks beautiful. Uh, the, the book is incredibly cool. It is very small, but extremely chunky. So, um, so um uh it's around i would say it's around twice as thick as uh Mokbok, the, the base game uh anyway, it's it's really fun uh the illustrations are gorgeous the the manufacturing has been uh done to a t it's honestly it's one of the the coolest uh, rpg book i own which is the rpg book i own which i'm pretty happy about i also received the uh, artback edition of a uh, uh demon bone sarcophagus 
the newest game by Patrick Stewart, not that one. Um, <laughs> the other one. And, yeah. <laughs> it is not that one. It is we uh, had the just, other one! just an RPG. The man, for, funny. the man of the face palm gif, you right? The animated gif, yeah. <laughs> it is it is also an incredibly uh, fun book this one is more of an osr a single adventure exploring uh, an underground tomb uh, people might know uh, patrick stewart from his book um, Vinge is a book exploring the how to play um, an rpg game into a cavern and what kind of weird creature might live in cavern and it's like a very speleological exploration of cavern systems and trying to push how those should be very, should be very different from dungeons. The idea of like uh, small crevices that you have to uh, slinker and sliver into to uh, arrive at massive um, caverns that are five times bigger than a cathedral and then uh, having to dive into an underground lake to uh, underground lake to uh, uh spelling under some hidden tunnels like there's there's some really fun ideas that give a lot of flavor to uh, a game in, that happens in a cave and i would say that it's probably one of my favorite rpg book uh in terms of content uh, rather than just look uh and uh, uh and uh, demon bones arc vegas so far really fun uh, I would recommend people to have a look at it. Uh, in any case, just lots of RPG, not a lot of um, board game recently. But um, what about uh, you, Audrey? Uh, for me, yeah, not a lot. Uh, even though yeah, still work uh, is making me busy. Uh, we haven't managed to play any games when my husband has, uh, he was sick, uh, he ended up being sick when we had something planned, uh, so which was a big shame. Uh, I've been following the uh, Tainted Grey newest uh, Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter. Uh, I really like the daily stretch goals thing that they do. Uh, because I feel that there is less pressure, uh, less, yeah, it's less bumping out and promoting add-ons everywhere, which I really enjoy. It doesn't seem that there won't be any, that there won't be any uh, or a lot of add-ons on this campaign, which I think is great having something, let's say, tighter, uh, in, is in my opinion always uh, appreciated. And the fact that they are putting all of these mini expansions uh, in the base pledge makes things more... That's yeah. a very positive signal. Yeah, in, in my opinion, that's really, really something very positive. Uh, beyond that, um, I'm planning some role-playing games. I had a Starfinder game. Um, we're going to end the D&D campaign very soon, mastered by my husband. And I'm looking at some uh, RPG Kickstarter campaign, uh, which sadly isn't very, let's say, French friendly due to... The... Yes? Is it the Secret World uh, inspired by the uh, ancient Funcom MMO? video game. Oh, damn. Yeah. Uh, it's a five edition, uh, it's a five edition uh, setting and rule set. Uh, fifth edition. Um, and um, yeah, the, the main problem that the main problem that my friends have is that it's um, the books are hosted through drive through RPG, so it means that uh, when you um, the books are hosted through drive through RPG, so it means that uh, when you do the Kickstarter campaign, you will get a voucher that will allow you to print uh, one book at cost uh, by drive through. And then if you want extra copies, it will be at a uh, higher cost, but there aren't... It seems to be a bit, let's say, complicated for backers, while in the same time it's convenient for the project makers, since they just don't have to bother about printing, about logistics, anything, it's all handled by uh, drive through So I think it's a really uh, double-edged... Uh... But it has to be said that... Uh... Uh, all environmentally friendly initiatives are always paid by the end buyer and that it's not that right <laughs> yeah it's it's really I, I i don't really know uh how things are going to so that's it we move from local catch-up news to global news we have a lot of news 
Yeah. yeah, it's been an eventful uh, few weeks. Yeah, uh, shall I begin? I, I have one sure. I want to I want to go report. for it, Alessio. Yeah. <laughs> so first news is for beyond first news is for Beyond the Sun uh, fans because basically uh, Ken Hill from Rio Grande Games uh, moved to Eagle Griffon Games. Uh, Probably people who follow BGG have stumbled into Ken because Ken was a very supportive product manager. Because Ken was a very supportive product manager and a co-designer of a lot of games and very involved with Rio Grande Games and Rio Grande Gra Games presence on BGG. So uh, a lot of people was of course alarmed by Ken Hill moving to Eagle Gryphon Games and uh, Ken Hill moving to Eagle Gryphon Games. And uh, these days there has been a lot of discussion and talk in the Beyond the Sun forums because uh, uh, Ken Hill was overseeing the production of the uh, much-awaited expansion which should have been announced this summer. Uh, it is, uh, of course, delayed, Neil uh, moved. But anyway, uh, to, re to reassure people, of course, the designer of Beyond the Sun is Dennis K. Chen, who is still... Uh, on Rio Grande Games payroll and with exclusive with uh, Beyond the Sun. So there's really not much to worry about production. My, at the moment, there's not a lot to worry about, except that, of course, that's a, a, that's a, a good deal for a, a bargain for Eagle Gryphon Games because Ken Hill is very precious as a person. So that's it. First news. Yeah. I, I didn't know uh, him too much. Ken Hill is very precious as a person. So that's it. First news. Yeah, I I didn't know uh, him too much, but uh, from what I've heard, he's been uh, quite uh, quite popular on BGG. So I hope that uh, things are going to be uh, all right for his future. Yeah, but, but, but in the games, you must trust them that... Uh, uh, in a year, they always make a hit game. So uh, Ken was uh, a key figure in uh, making these games. Uh, and let's hope that uh, things turn out the best for Eagle Gryphon Games and for, uh, things turn out the best for Eagle Gryphon Games and for Rio Grande. Uh, anyway, uh, another, yeah. On another uh, side news, something that has been uh, quite good recently is that uh, container costs and uh, shipping costs from uh, Asia seems to have finally started to uh, come down. I think at their best place in the past two years uh, recently. So we can hope that finally the, the container crisis is over and that uh, board games uh, price inflation is not going to uh, become too much of a thing for the next year. Are you kidding me? You, do you mean that there's good news in the world today? Yeah, it's we we have to take them when they come. Incredible. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I have another news. Yeah. It comes from a small uh, board game design and publishing company, which is called Doomsday Robots. Uh, it comes from a small uh, board game design and publishing company, which is called Doomsday Robots. Uh, they have published two games so far, which are called Zoograph Zoography sorry, and Bridges to Nowhere. I haven't heard of these games, uh, but I saw relayed on uh, Facebook basically how they plan to, let's say, bring ethics uh, into their crowdfunding campaigns. Um, which uh, is very backer oriented, uh, such as they promise to use the backer funds only for the project until delivery is a first delivery uh, that they don't want to censor uh, backers communication, which for this one, I mean, it should be uh, not an issue, but okay. Uh, all of all the, uh, the two previous ones, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. The one about funds is an obvious, but the one about um, ah, blah, blah, blah. the one about funds is an obvious, but the one about backers being first to have the products sometimes can be air eh, when it's one or two months. I personally don't mind, but 
Uh, okay, and uh, they choose to accurately represent shipping costs, uh, even if they subsidize them, which I think is... Mm, and they want to provide monthly financial reports to backers to show how the money is being used. I think that is a very interesting one, because I don't recall ever seeing any company uh, do something of the sort. So I think that uh, this promise, uh, this specific one, looks like when a company uh, is honest on that. At least uh, we've not seen that at this level. I recall a few campaigns like trying to be honest with their, their costs and everything, but they seem to go above and beyond. Uh, the, the way that campaigns usually yeah. Uh, yeah. Talk I about recall, their finances. I recall seeing past uh, comp that campaigns usually yeah. Uh, yeah. Talk I about recall, their finances. I recall seeing past uh, campaigns where they show an estimate of how the cost uh, should uh, be, let's say, split between the different uh, things, but not a monthly report. That's something very different, and I'm very, very curious about that. And the last two promises, be, let's say, split between the different uh, things, but not a monthly report. That's something very different, and I'm very, very curious about that. And the last two promises is that they promise to never make the MSRP of the games lower than the equivalent pledge amount. Um, this one is, in my opinion, the equivalent pledge amount. Um, this one is, in my opinion, fair, but uh, anyway, there will be at some point store discounts or stuff like that, so the games will probably at some uh, specific dates a bit cheaper at retail uh, than uh, during the crowdfunding campaign, which I don't really retail uh, than uh, during the crowdfunding campaign, which I don't really mind anyway. And the last one I think is really excellent. They say that they commit to include backers as partners in the process of creation comma, and not just pre-order customers. And I think that it's really interesting to have not at all. It's 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 very good, and I hope that more companies <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, good recognize news. that. I I also um, I'm just a little bit worried because a lot of Kickstarter campaigns um, get their funding through hype, and they try to lie times to be like, oh, we only need uh, thirty thousand dollars. When in truth, they probably need a million. But if they say we only need uh, thirty uh, thirty thousand. Uh, they can say that they've been funded in under five minutes and then they can claim that they have been funded at 5,000% and then they could percent and then they could, can go to their investors and use those inflated numbers to try to get more money behind or maybe to try to, to push uh, themselves to the top of Kickstarter because that's a, a metric that uh, Kickstarter used to promote um, uh, Kickstarter. And I think that's that's kind of a, a toxic business, uh, not a good way to... A toxic business, uh, not a good way to function, but unfortunately, that's that's the reality of how uh, Kickstarter functions. So we have to hope that uh, this this openness and this um, uh, honesty uh, with with backers is not going to backfire in their face. And uh, when they don't uh, when they don't meet the um, the unfair expectations set by other Kickstarter, like for example, uh, a Kickstarter that gives a proper uh, time estimate and a Kickstarter that lies and say that they can make in uh, six months what they know should take uh, a year or two. Uh, well, the first Kickstarter, uh, well, the first Kickstarter that said that they will take two years might not get the same backing as the one that say, well, you have your stuff in six months and then, uh, you know, it's not delivered. Um, I, I don't know if there's a good solution to that, but that's something that we need to keep an eye on. And speaking of Kickstarter that inflated their... <laughs> Better Studio. Yes. The uh, one be behind Project L, by, by the way. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you know that story better, unless you're sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, of, of course. Uh, many of you could know that Kingdom Come Deliverance OK was, uh, is a video game. There's a board game adaptation which was being uh, licensed to uh, Bork Better Studio. They made the Kickstarter campaign. I have to say it looked interesting for some aspects, but I waited to check it because I... Uh, uh, the, the, the entire game was described uh, on broad strokes, there were a few reviews kind of of some aspects which weren't really saying anything, 
um, the entire campaign I, I didn't understand what kind of game uh, uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance uh, game uh, uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance uh, was going to be anyway uh, they had uh, a very low and unrealistic uh, funding goal uh, I think on the 50 uh, on the fifty thousand dollars or something like that they uh, funded funded in the usual uh, tot minutes uh, some hours or whatever and uh, they reached uh, like uh, some uh, uh, hundreds of dollars of funding uh, and they were going rather stable uh, so after a while uh, but the, that uh, they weren't going to make it they were shutting down the project and everyone was going to be refunded because they they really just uh, set the funding goal uh, low because they wanted to advertise it as uh, funded in 10 minutes but but uh, after all uh, they they weren't going to cover all the costs and they were going to fail so they just folded and that's it uh, as a result of this the entire Bork better studio which was actually a decent studio uh, which was actually a decent studio uh, they made project l after all we talked about it you talked about it alexis <laughs> uh, yeah exactly and uh, and the Borku Peter studio is closing so uh, they, they promise that this is not the uh, they, they promise that this is not the last time we hear from them but uh, it's probably the last time we are from Borku Peter studio and uh, that's it speak about uh, unrealistic crowdfunding goals yeah, it's very unfortunate about uh, unrealistic crowdfunding goals. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, uh, especially since they, they jumped from a Project L that was a really simple, small little game that I think that cost maybe 30 euros. I, I want to say it like very, I want to say it like very small price. And then they jumped into something that was uh, way bigger that was way more into the the hundred of, of euro uh, price range with kingdom come and i think that they didn't really have the means to jump there and the promotion that i don't i can't really blame them for that because that's that's what the uh, that's what the the business is like at the moment like you need to lie about your your thing because otherwise you don't get the backing and yeah you I have think to, that's something you have to that's... play the game if you want to get something out of it yeah exactly and i think that's something definitely uh look at i mean the the company uh has had a lot of issues to handle recently and they've not done uh, that great of a job but i think that's something that has been uh, more and more of an issues recently, and I hope that Kingdom Comes uh, failing at least will uh, maybe change into the the business. Um, we'll have to see how that uh, how that comes. Yeah, speaking of uh, weird business practices, uh, there is one last item of news we wanted to to bring up to attention, which is Yellow and Yangtze, which is a uh, famous gray. Uh, famous grail game we talked about from the aptly named grail game house uh, is going to be uh, reprinted under the name of huang h-u-a-n-g uh, this is uh, extremely good news because if you are a Reinhardt Mixia fan extremely good news because if you are a Reinhardt Mixia fan or you just want to play the physical board game of Yellow and Yaxi, uh, you probably know that it's out it has been out of production uh, for ages and uh, the costs on the secondary market are exaggerated like exaggerated like uh, uh, you could buy when there was the whale uh, riders kickstarter which was the last kickstarter bundling yellow and yancy you could get yellow and yancy for like 15 dollars or uh, like 20 australian dollars so uh, the geek market for like 100 dollars or so so uh, it's extremely expensive and it's a very good game so it's beautiful news that it's getting reprinted 
However, uh, there's a problem with licensing because uh, Dr. Knizzi actually licensed it to uh, Grey Games, uh, but uh, but uh, in the end, uh, Grey Games just sold it uh, in Kickstarter to countries they weren't allowed to. So the the new Kickstarter which will bring one. So the, the new Kickstarter, which will bring Wang, will be available only in the UK, France, Poland and US. So it will still have limited distribution, but we can get around that. So on the, on overall, this is good news. And on overall, this is good news. And that's it. And that's it for the news. Um... Let's move back and talk about some uh, alchemy game that uh, Audrey uh, wants to, to discuss. Yes, uh, I'm bringing today the game Artificium, uh, which is a game Chargorodsky, if I say it properly. Uh, my French tongue isn't really made for let's say, Slavic uh, names. And uh, a fun fact is that he's also the designer of the game. Uh, the game has been published by Asmodee and Lifestyle Board Games and he to upgrade them into other components. Um, the components of the game, not of the alchemy, are quite simple. You have a big board, which is basically a turn uh, counter and points, uh, small boards for each player to track which resources they have, and cards. Each player takes a ball, player to track which resources they have, and cards. Each player takes a ball, then the game plays in um, four turns, and each turn will play the same. There is a phase of the draft, where the players get cards from a common market uh, at the middle. Then there is a card playing, players get cards from a common market uh, at the middle. Then there is a card playing phase, where the players play their cards to upgrade their resources. And they gain points when they do the uh, resources upgrades. And rinse and repeat four times. That's all there is to know uh, for this and rinse and repeat four times. That's all there is to know uh, for this game on how the turns go. Then the interesting part is the player board. You have uh, different uh, boxes where you can put some uh, little um, acrylic markers, boxes where you can put some uh, little um, acrylic markers, like the, all these diamond-shaped, uh, crystal-shaped uh, acrylic markers that we can find in many other games, and you put them into the boxes to show how many of uh, the resource of that box you have. Like, for instance, you have a box of the that means that you have two breads. And when you play the cards, the card will tell you to convert resources into other ones. For instance, there is a card which tells you to upgrade coal and steel to make a third. And there is a point a number on this card, which says you score five points when you play this card. It's a marker which is in the coal, and you put it back into the bank, and you take one marker in the steel, and you put that one into the third box. Or you can do the opposite if you prefer to put the coal back uh, into the bank and upgrade the steel uh, token. It's the same! <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, you have at the very end... Exactly. Um, and uh, you have at the very end, you will upgrade uh, wood and um, it's um, uh, a cereal, which, which are the very basic resources. And you have some cards that uh, help you get these resources. And uh, here, let's say resources are the coal, the bread and meat. And then you have the crystals and the third. And uh, at the end, you have the sword and alchemy, uh, some kind of potions. And you can, uh, at the very, very end, convert some of these and one token, which are also coins, when you have them. I hey, I'm know. coming yeah. to it! <laughs> <laughs> at the very end, you can convert... Oh, no, I said... Uh, I think I said... Um, um, the second tier resources, there is beer, actually, which is very important. Because at the very end, you have the powerful card, which lets you convert either a sword or, or a potions, and a beer, 
um, the second tier resources there is B actually which is very important because at the very end you have the powerful card which lets you convert either a sword or, or a potions and a beer and a coin to get a wizard or a knight and when you get a wizard you get to draw uh, I don't know exactly how many but it's something like draw 8 cards keep 5 or something like that and if you do a knight you get to uh, take uh, 8 points out of uh, someone else and each of these guys uh, directly also make you get 5, uh, oh no, not 5, 8 points. So these are like the score. That's where you convert it into beer, upgrade some coal into etc etc. That's the main thing of the game, there is just one last uh, specialty, it's that some of the cards are action cards, they are a bit uh, specific and they can let you uh, retake, uh, redraw one card. Action is a cool mechanic uh, when you manage to change something to something else with the game. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's really fun. One thing that I really like about the game, I think that you, you showed it to me uh, last time I, I visited Probably. you. Um, or the one before the last because last time was just middle probably um, or the one before the last because last time was just midara 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 <laughs> <laughs> midara for hours and hours uh, one thing that i i kind of um really liked about this game is i i don't really know what it is about its artwork but it kind of reminds me of those um isometric um, isometric uh strategy game a bit like a warcraft 3 and there's just a very like cartoony, uh, cute little aspect to every building that is displayed on those cards that is just uh, inherently uh, exciting. I think. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a '90s uh, game with the algae. You you know, I, I I never thought of that, but they look like Warcraft three human buildings, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Overall, yeah. I don't think it's a very, let's say, impressive game that's going to let you uh, spend hours and hours on it. The interaction between players is is extremely low. It's just a, ba a, a drafting battle. And maybe if you get a card that allows you to manipulate the cards of the other players. But I think by now you guys all know that I like uh, low interaction games uh, most still, of the time. Still cards, still uh, resources, right? Right? That's uh, the player I, interaction. You, I don't remember if you can really steal uh, resources. Um, you can randomly pick a card from any player card. Uh, you can return one of the cards that you have played this turn to your hand. You can, uh, yes, manipulate a bit the resources of the other players by paying cards you've played. Yeah, I'm under the impression that the economy of the actions of the conversions you do is like a long chain of stuff. So... Get, losing a resource because someone stole it or just uh, moved it or removed it, it could be quite frustrating. It, it I can think. be stole it or just uh, moved it or removed it. it could be quite frustrating. It, it I can think. be terrible, yes. <laughs> yeah. And when I went over BGG, where the game has a rating of 6, which is not very exceptional, uh, one of the complaints that was there, which um, I, I had not, let's say, formalized myself, but I formalized myself, but I totally agree with, is that if the cards you get before you have that drafting phase, because you get a hand and then you can draft and exchange stuff, um, if you are unlucky with your hands, you, you can't be completely um, messed. Actually, some people being disappointed from their first start, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, on the positive side, however, I think that this is the... Uh, I, I cannot think of other... Uh, except maybe Res Arcana, which is another kind of... So it's uh, a bit different. Very different. Yeah. Uh, it's the only game who gets to a player count of six with building an engine and plays in less than an hour. Yeah, I, I really like this about uh, Artificial, from the, the way that I looked at it uh, at the very least. The game seems... Plays in less than an hour. Yeah, I, I really like this about uh, Artificial from the, the way that I looked at it uh, at the very least. The game seems to be easy to transport, easy to explain, easy to play. It's just, uh, it's very nice. I always appreciate a game that has um, a score counter, um, like a, 
a score counter, um, like a, a track race. Uh, I think that's that's always a good way to keep track of who's winning at the moment. I I find that a lot of games that don't have it often you just finish a game and then you you look at your your points, you count them, and then oh I was. 20 points behind and I could have not have won. When you have a track counter at the very least, you, you know where you are and there can be a little bit more interaction. Uh, so, and so you, you know who to target with your knight. Exactly. <laughs> it's the point. So, so you can get the present here earlier. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the artwork is uh, pretty decent also because it's made by the designer. So kudos to, for that because I always appreciate when that happens. Uh, not a lot of people have this talent. Ryan Lockett is another famous one. Uh, but uh, one thing I have to say against the materials of this game is the thing, right? You put you you put it in uh, coal, it's coal. You put it uh, outside uh, the board, it's money and stuff. It's always a gem, right? Yeah. Yeah, which is on one hand is very practical because you don't have to move around a lot of different components gems those polygonal gems those tokens they are the worst token ever <laughs> just give me cardboard cylinders and if you ever drop your board you can just remember which was where <laughs> yeah exactly it's not uh, kid resistant or cat resistant resistant or cat resistant Yes, we're talking about you, Kat. <laughs> uh, say hi to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's all for Artificium, and we're going to be able to go to the next game, where Alexis is going to talk Artificium, and we're going to be able to go to the next game, where Alexis is going to talk to us about the Resistance. Yes. Uh, well, I was, we were just talking about back uh, backstepping people. Uh, the Resistance is the perfect game for that. So this is a hidden role game uh, made by uh, Don Escrant is the perfect game for that. So this is a hidden role game uh, made by uh, Don Eskridge uh, in 2009. Uh, it's the same people that made uh, the Resistance Avalon and just recently uh, Dune the Betrayal. Uh, I think that you might uh, start to pick up a team at some point. Uh, it's a very fun take on the hidden uh, agenda uh, type game. Um, the base game, not so much, but it comes with a couple of expansion that I think uh, bring something to the genre that is kind of missing. So. Uh, the base idea is that you have a majority of spies and a majority of resistance people. You have a leader that is assigned every turn. The leader is going to uh, send a group of people into a mission. Uh, I think that first it's two people, then three, then four, then three, then four. Uh, and the point is that the leader is going to choose who's um, secretly. The game is pretty interesting because it gives a lot more information than uh, Werewolf. Uh, I, I enjoy Werewolf uh, as anybody, but mostly for the social aspect. I think that as a game, you don't get a lot of information and a lot of good reason to distrust someone. And, and as often uh, with the wrong group of people, it can really um, end up being a bit of a, oh, I know you because you always lie. Uh, oh, I, I don't trust you because you betrayed me last round. It, can turn a little bit petty with the wrong group, a group of people. With the resistance, you get some information. You have last round. It can turn a little bit petty with the wrong group, a group of people. With the resistance, you get some information. You have a leader that is assigned every turn that's going to assign people. Uh, I think that the game pre uh, preludes. Um, uh, oh, what's what's that game? Uh, Secret Hitler. Uh, pre uh, preludes. Um, uh, oh, what's what's that game? Uh, Secret Hitler. Um, but the, the resistance kind of uh, builds on, uh, well, I created that ID and uh, started that kind of trend where you need to select a few people to trust them and they can decide. To... <laughs> uh, the expansion is called uh, The Plot Thickens. Oh, uh, no. And it, it is uh, really good, actually. I really like it because it adds... Um, plot cards that the leader can assign uh, every turn. I think that it's one the first turn, then two, then three, uh, something that 
the leader cannot give himself a plot card. So he needs to trust people and to know where to give those cards that can have a certain amount of power. For example, uh, being able to uh, read the card of someone else or uh, being able to... Uh, uh, decide that a team that a team is now uh, do a vote of no confidence and decide that a team that has been set up is not good and that uh, force people to uh, to do uh, to remake a new team and change the leadership. Uh, those powers are quite strong, and what's good is that you kind of are incentivized to use them um, uh, as soon as you can and to be as effective as you can. Uh, while in in of a game, for example, uh, Werewolf, because that's that's pretty much the, um, the, the star of the genre there. Yeah, the standout. Um, often you kind of don't want to reveal your uh, role too early because you can get can get killed. And if you get killed on the first turn and the game lasts kind of long because there's a lot of people, you can just stay on the, um, on the back seat for like, I don't know, 30 minutes. Uh, it's not really fun in the resistance. Everybody is constantly active, even if you have been outed as a spy. It's never certain information, unless you played uh, pretty badly. And the rounds are pretty pretty short. I think that it's between twenty and thirty minutes to have a full game. Uh, overall, I'd say that's maybe not the best uh, Eden rule game, but definitely one that I I always enjoy playing with the family, especially with the expansion. That was just me checking. Yes, 2012. <laughs> um, Don Eskridge released another game called Avalon the Resistance. Uh, and that one takes place in Avalon with the Arthurian legend. I wouldn't it have adds... guessed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it adds uh, a few uh, additional, new, uh, additional rules. It reuses a lot of the good stuff from uh, the Resistance. I like the team a little bit less. The Resistance, the original one, is uh, set up in this uh, sort of grim cyberpunk uh, scene. It's about uh, people resisting some, um, some like a, uh, uh, what is it, a corrupt government uh, with a government spy within their rank. Avalon is about uh, knights and monsters. It's a little bit less attracting to me, but. Uh, it's quite a fun game, and a lot of people like it and see it as a like direct improvement of the resist resistance. Uh, I've not uh, played it myself because I've I've always enjoyed the resistance, but I think that Alessio did. Uh, yeah, I, I played quite a lot in my time of the resistance Avalon. Uh, I have to say I always thought it was just a reskin of the resistance, so I don't know about that. It was just a reskin of the resistance, so I don't know about the other rules. But uh, uh, we can say that the resistance Avalon just builds up on the concept of the original werewolf game and uh, its hidden rules. Uh, I have to say, uh, you have uh, the, the two teams. Uh, I have to say, uh, you have uh, the, the two teams. Uh, the spies uh, are the Mordred Knights. Uh, now, uh, I have played the Italian version as usual, so I will probably try to guess the names in English, but they are the Knights loyal to Mordred, and the other side is the Knight updated roles you can see in these, uh, in these kind of games. Uh, I played this game so much that I actually have an opinion of on how easy it is to win as the uh, Black Knights, because uh, unless the Mer uh, you know, Merlin is the one who knows all the name of all the Black Knights, uh, but uh, if uh, he exposes himself, he just get killed in, <laughs> he just get killed uh, immediately. So uh, he doesn't do anything with that. So uh, the let's say the uh, air, uh, the let's say the uh, air quotes good guys only have the. Um, only, only have the, the Merlin player to defend themselves because uh, uh, the Resistance Avalon is a bit skewed towards uh, the spies Black Knights. Towards uh, the spies Black Knights. Uh, so that's basically the game. If you have a good Merlin player, you can win. If you have a bad Merlin player, you will probably lose. 
of course that, that depends but in the end when the group is consolidated when you play with family play with family people who knows themselves and so on uh, yeah really your only chance is to have a good marlin player yeah that seems quite different from the resistance because there's no player that knows every role in the in that oh, game okay, uh, okay. it's it's so a very see, different yeah. um uh, dynamic signed by the, the leader. So I think that both games are probably uh, different from the way that you explain it. Yeah, uh, you, I've had a better experience with the resistance. Yeah, you, uh, you probably but... have. Uh, you probably have more. Uh, you 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 then uh, the, the rules upgrade is probably the player roles because you have Mordred, you have Morgana, you have uh, uh, Merlin, you have Parsifal, you have a lot of special powers. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that um, those kind of games, it's not so much about having a very solid set of rules. It's more about the, the social and fun aspect yeah, of it. Yeah, of course. Uh, pretty much all that's what's going to uh, make those games fun. The, there, um, are, uh, there are three big games, which are party games uh, everyone loves, and they are Secret Hitler, uh, one night ultimate werewolf which i think is the that's best that's the best werewolf yeah, yeah yeah probably and the resistance Avalon, at least for what i know and they are all deserving to be played yeah um audrey uh i know that you have not played uh the resistance or maybe once uh probably once uh, a very three. very long time ago yes yeah uh, i've never uh, I don't remember if you've mentioned if you like uh, those kind of resistance or maybe once. Uh, Probably once uh, a very, three. very long time ago, yes. Yeah. Uh, I've never, uh, I don't remember if you've mentioned if you like uh, those kind of social deduction games or not. I, I don't think so. But uh, maybe I'm wrong. I used to like playing Shadow Hunters uh, a long while ago. I used to like playing Shadow Hunters uh, a long while ago. Uh, yeah, due to because I, I uh, like, like uh, in Werewolf, for instance, I don't like you have the deduction, having to deduct and stuff without any clues. I don't really like that. Um, the thing with the resistance is I'm going for me, and yeah, that was Bang also. Oh, I love <laughs> Bang. Bang is great. I yes, same for me. I I think that the game needs to have some ways of giving some information and do doing something with the deduction it can't just be people being bad liars because that's that's very unreliable yeah some information and do doing something with the deduction it can't just be people being bad liars because that's that's very unreliable yeah i really liked bang as well uh, a long while ago and yeah that was more than 10 years ago i'm feeling old now so <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah, th th this is actually party social detection games because th there are a lot of other social detection games we already covered, like The Thing, Infection at Outpost 31, uh, that fan win at the last turn on yeah, the helicopter. That, yeah, damn that's fan. quite a that's quite a bigger one though because it lasts like a it's quite a <laughs> that's quite a bigger one though because it lasts like a good hour and hour and a half, but it's a lot of fun. Um, that's that's kind of like the evolution of the. Uh, one the thing genre, that say. one thing that for me was a, a very fun part of Shadow Hunters was uh, uh, destroying the HP of one person. Uh, not dead yet, but <laughs> who is well? Still, that's mean. Yeah. Who can who can still exist that has more HP than that? Who? Oh, oh no, you're the vampire! Ah! <laughs> I really like this, these moments. Yeah, I think that that games like this need to have uh, some mechanical fun with it, and not just suss out who has the red card. Um, yeah. So, is the resistance recommended? Uh, I would say that's a big recommendation for me, and I would say I'd recommend the resistance more than the resistance Avalon, according to to your opinion of the resistance Avalon. Oh, but yeah. I would need to play it at some point. Yeah, I and I would need to play the resistance. I actually said the next this negative is uh, coming from experience. So if you play the resistance Avalon, you'll have many many plays and have a blast until someone will drop the curtain for you. I would I would say for the resistance though, uh, do try to grab the expansion. Uh, they're not that expensive. I think that's uh, the resistance. Say for the resistance though, uh, do try to grab the expansion. Uh, they're not that expensive. I think that uh, the resistance usually comes with at least one. 
uh, they are very fun and they add a lot of uh, breath to the game. Um, in any case, I think that's all the time that we have for this episode. So you can catch The Last Andy or at The Last Andy on Twitter. And uh, until next time, we have been The Last Andy. That's a uh, goodbye from Alessio. Uh, bye. <laughs> from Audrey. Bye bye. She's gone. She's well, gone, man. I I'll yeah. insert an ancient uh, Audrey uh, goodbye. Uh, what? <laughs> uh, I think Audacity picked it, but not Discord. Uh, that, that's fine. It will it will sound great on the recording. No, keep uh, it. Uh, no. Uh, and, <laughs> don't, don't cut. and from myself. And remember that the second E in Standy stands for Anisio. Uh, actually, whatever. I was thinking of experiment, but it has not uh, much sense. Much sense now. That doesn't so, stop by experience. <laughs>